This is sections 15.8 and 15.9 of Honors Algebra 2, Basic Probability. First, with vocabulary. An experiment in which you do not necessarily get the same outcome when you repeat it under the same conditions is called a random experiment. The set of all possible outcomes of a random experiment is known as the sample space for the experiment. So all of the possible things you can get as a result of your random experiment. Any subset of possible outcomes for an experiment, a subset of the sample space, is known as an event. All right, some examples. Let's say I take a single fair coin like this nickel. It's got heads, it's got tails. If I flip it, what are the possible outcomes? Well, I can get tails, or I can get mm, tails again, or I can go and get heads. So the sample space consists of just heads and tails. And I write it in set notation. It's the set of all possible outcomes. So I can get heads or I can get tails. It doesn't matter if I write the H first or the T first. How about I take a single six-sided die, numbered one, two, three, four, five, and six on the sides. If I roll it, what are the possible outcomes I can get? Well, I could get a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. So that is my sample space. What specifically is the event that the number I get is greater than two? Well, that would be the event that I get either a three, a four, a five, or a six. That is the subset of my sample space that deals with that event. It's the outcomes that give me uh, my desired outcome of a number greater than two. So notice that is a subset of my sample space. Okay, let's say that I take two six-sided dice. When it's plural, it's dice. When it's one, it's die. What if I take two six-sided dice? How many elements are going to be in that sample space? Well, I could get a one and a one, or a one and a two, or a one and a three, or a one and a four, or a one and a five, or a one and a six, a two and a one, a two and a two, a two and a three, a two and a four, a two and a five, a two and a six, three and a one, three and two, three and three, three and four, three and five, three and six, four and one, four and two, four and three, four and four, four and five, four and six, five and one, five and two, five and three, five and four, five and five, five and six, or a six and a one, six and two, six and three, six and four, six and five and six and six. How many different outcomes are there? Hmm? Did you count them up? I think you did. There are 36 possible outcomes, 36 elements in the sample space, where I'm treating each die separately. So if I get a 1 on the first die and a 2 on the second die, that's different from getting a 2 on the first die and a 1 on the second die. Okay, so each die is separate. 36 different outcomes, 6 times 6. Because there's 6 outcomes on one die, 6 on the other. That leaves me with 36 possible outcomes. What specifically is the event that the sum of the numbers that I get is 7. So since each die is separate, I'm going to note each uh, element of my sample space as an ordered pair, where the first number is the number I get on the first die, the second number is the number I get on the second die. So if I want the sum to be 7, I could get a 1 on the first die and a 6 on the second die. That'll get me a 7. Well, I can get a 2 on the first die and a 5 on the second die, or a 3 on the first die and a 4 on the second die, or a 4 on the first die and a 3 on the second die, a 5 on the first die, and a 2 on the second die, a 6 on the first die, and a 1 on the second die. And that's all the possible ways that I can get 7, a sum of 7. That's 6 out of my 36 elements. Give me a sum of 7. Capiche? Good. Now the likelihood of an event occurring is called its probability. And the probability of an event is essentially the number of ways that the event can occur divided by the number of elements in the sample space. So when I flip a coin, what's the probability of getting a head? Well, there are two possible outcomes, heads and tails. The number of elements in the sample space, we found the sample space, it was H and T. Here is the sample space. So the number of elements in the sample space is 2, that's the denominator. The number of ways that my event can occur is just 1. 
Uh, if I went ahead, there's only one element in my sample space that achieves that result. So the probability of getting a head is one half. What's the probability of getting a tail? One half. When I roll a single six-sided die, what's the probability of rolling a four? Well, the sample space was the elements one, two, three, four, five, and six. How many of them give me a four? Only one of them. How many are there total? There are six. So one sixth is the probability of rolling a four. The probability of rolling a three is also one sixth. The probability of rolling a six is one sixth. What's the probability of rolling an odd number? Well, remember my sample space was one, two, three, four, five, and six. How many of those numbers are odd? Well, there's number one, three, and five. So I've got three ways of getting what I want, divided by the number of elements in the sample space is six. So three out of six will give me an odd number. That gives me a probability of, when I simplify it, one half. What's the probability of rolling a number greater than six? Well, I look at my sample space. I've got one, two, three, four, five, and six. How many of those are greater than six? Zero. How many elements are in the sample space? Six. What's zero divided by six? Zero. So the probability of rolling a number greater than six is zero. I should not be rolling a number greater than six when my numbers only go from one to six, right? What's the probability of rolling a number greater than zero? Okay, well, my sample space is one, two, three, four, five, and six. How many of those are greater than zero? Six of them. How many elements are in the sample space? Six. What's six divided by six? One. So the probability of rolling a number greater than zero is one. I should definitely be getting a number greater than zero when I roll this. Probabilities have to be between zero and one, including zero or one. I cannot have a probability less than zero. I cannot have a probability greater than one because the numerator of the fraction cannot be bigger than the denominator of the fraction. The denominator is all of the elements in the sample space. The numerator is just the elements in the sample space that give me what I want. So that can't be bigger than the elements in the sample space. There are 12 tulip bulbs in a package. Nine will yield yellow tulips, and three will yield red tulips. Nine yellow, two red. That's nine yellow, three red. 12 total. If two tulip bulbs are selected at random, so I don't know which colors they are, find the probability of both tulips being red. All right? So I want the number of ways that I can pick two red bulbs divided by the number of ways of picking any two red, any two bulbs. Okay? Well, the number of ways of picking red bulbs, if there are three of them, that's going to be combination of three things taken two at a time. Because if there are three red bulbs in there, imagine like it's uh, bulb A, bulb B, and bulb C. So I could pick A and B and get two red bulbs. I could pick A and C and get two red bulbs. I could pick B and C and get two red bulbs. So the combination of three things picked two at a time. Remember, it's n factorial divided by r factorial times n minus r factorial. So it's three factorial divided by two factorial times three minus two is one factorial. So one factorial is one, two factorial is two, three factorial is six, so this is three divi uh, six divided by two, which is three. Okay? That's the numerator of my fraction. The number of ways that I can get what I want. The denominator is the number of total possible outcomes. Alright, well, I've got twelve bulbs, and I'm picking two at a time. So it's the combination of 12 things chosen two at a time. That's 12 factorial divided by 2 factorial times 12 minus 2 factorial. So that's 12 factorial divided by 2 factorial times 10 factorial. I don't need a calculator for this because I know 12 factorial is 12 times 11 times 10 times 9 times 8, which is 10 factorial, right? over 2 factorial times 10 factorial, the 10 factorials cancel. 2 factorial is just 2, which will cancel to the 12, making 6. 6 times 11 is 66. So there are 66 elements in my sample space. I don't want to list them all out. But I don't need to. I just need to know how many there are. So my probability then becomes 3 divided by 66, which is 1 22nd. one over twenty two. What's the probability of 
picking one tulip bulb that's yellow and the other one that's red. Okay, so the number of ways of picking one yellow bulb and one red bulb would be if there are nine yellow bulbs, a combination of nine things picked one at a time, times the combination of picking three things one at a time. If there are three red bulbs and I'm picking one of them. Okay, that's the numerator. The denominator is still 66. There's still 66 things in my sample space. All right, so I've got nine factorial divided by one factorial times nine minus one, which is eight factorial, times three factorial over one factorial times three minus one, which is two factorial, all divided by 66. Okay, well nine factorial is simply nine times eight factorial, so that eight factorial will cancel into the nine factorial, giving me nine over one because one factorial is one. Three factorial is three times two factorial. The two factorials will cancel giving me three over one. So nine times three is simply 27. 27 over 66 is nine over 22. So a much higher probability of picking one yellow and one red than the probability of picking two red, which makes sense because there are more yellows in there than there are reds. Lastly, the lifetimes of 60 watt light bulbs are normally distributed with a mean of 1,000 hours and a standard deviation of 100 hours. What is the probability that a bulb just put in a lamp will last more than 1,100 hours? That sounds complicated. Well, it's not. Because what the normal distribution is really doing is giving us probabilities. The area underneath the curve is a probability. So if this has a mean of 100 hours, the standard deviation of 100 hours. I want to know what's the probability the bulb will last more than 1100 hours. 1100 happens to be exactly one standard deviation above the mean. If I didn't know that, I could find its standardized value, its z-score, which is 1100 minus the mean of 1000 divided by the standard deviation of 100, which is 100 divided by 100, which is 1. So the standardized value of here is 1. Or just notice that 1000 plus the standard deviation of 100 makes 1100. So 1100 is exactly one standard deviation above the mean. So that means if I find this area to the right of 1100 underneath the normal distribution, I will have the probability of being greater than 1100 hours. The normal distribution gives me probabilities by finding the area underneath the curve. All right, how do I do that? Well, remember I use on my calculator normal CDF. I've got the normal CDF of the lower value of 1100, I'm sorry, the lower value of 1 is my standardized value, and the upper value of, say, a thousand, because I really want infinity, but we can't. And I'll simply do that in my calculator. One comma one thousand, lower value of one, upper value of one thousand, and I get point one five eight six five five and so on. So what's the probability? The probability is exactly that. It's a probability of point one five nine or so. Notice that's a number between 0 and 1, as probability should be. Okay? We'll do more examples of that in class. Here are your immediate practice problems. A coin is tossed and a die is rolled. So you're doing both. Write out the sample space, the set of all possible outcomes. Write them out as ordered pairs, where the first thing is the result of the coin being tossed, the second thing is the result of the die being rolled. Find the probability, then, of getting heads on the coin and an even number on the die. Just count up the things in your sample space that give you that. Divide it by the total number of elements in your sample space. And that is the end of sections 15.8 and 15.9.